My name is Virginia Wigand. I'm Director of Collections for the Clark County Historical Society. Welcome this morning to the Heritage Center of Clark County. Today we're going to talk about inventors and entrepreneurs. Springfield was a quintessentially American town at the frontier of many innovations of the 19th and 20th century. In fact, Springfield was so much at the center of these innovations and new inventions that some people called it the Silicon Valley of the 19th century. Right after the Civil War, Clark County was making and shipping those products which made the settlement and agricultural growth of the Midwest and the Great Plains possible. It was made possible because Springfield had four unique things that came together beautifully and created the golden era of Springfield, which was 1870 to 1930. In the beginning, Springfield was a tiny pioneer town and of maybe a few fields and a couple houses. And a hundred years later, it was an industrial and manufacturing giant, just not, not just nationally, but internationally. This happened because of four different things. Entrepreneurs, inventors, transportation, and resources. Entrepreneurs, now we would say those are the people that put their money where their mouth is. Those are the people who risk, and especially 19th century, you're talking about men who would risk their fortune to start a brand new business venture. Inventors, those are the people with passion, patience, and a lot of perseverance to create those new things that are going to make economic growth possible here in Springfield. Then you're talking about transportation. Of course, in the beginning, it was the National Road. By the 1840s, it was the railroad going north, south, east, and west from this hub that was Springfield. And last, you need resources, both natural resources and people resources. So let's go look at some of our inventors and entrepreneurs and how they changed Springfield. The first, well, one, first person we're going to see is James Leffel. He was actually born in Virginia, but he and his family moved here to Clark County. So Clark County has always claimed him as their first and most important inventor. In Springfield, because of the National Road, our population doubled between 1840 and 1850. Now, a little over 5,000 people doesn't sound like a lot, but it was when we started out with barely 2,500. So there was a big population jump. What that did was that there needed to be more crops and more land under production to help feed those people. Well, if you have land, then you also need some way to process those products. At the time, everyone was using what was called an overshot wheel. It's the one that's so very picturesque, and the wheel turns and pulls the water up and then over the top. Well, it is very picturesque, and water wheels have been around for a long time, but overshot wheels are unfortunately very inefficient. Leffel decided, in fact, it was indeed his passion, if you want to call it that, that he was going to invent a new type of water wheel that would be as at least efficient as an overshot wheel. And of course, he was hoping for something that was going to be a whole lot more. And so that's what he did. He really did not do a lot of inventions. Early on, he did something that was called the Buckeye cooking stove. And water wheels were really his passion. He came up with a brilliant idea, so brilliant that he's considered one of Ohio's best and most important early inventors. What he did was to take that round wheel, that instead of going up and over and around, he took it and turned it on its side, added double the vents or buckets, and oh my goodness, all of a sudden you have a water wheel that doesn't need much water and becomes 92 to 98 percent efficient. So all your energy is going in to, and all your work is going into energy production and because of what he invented there were almost 20 mills that decided to locate right above Buck Creek near the downtown side. In fact this place was one of the last ones that ever came down in Springfield itself. This was John Foo's linseed oil and paint factory and as you can see by this lovely picture there is the housing for Leffel's engine 
right down here near Buck Creek. The line shaft goes up into the factory and it was this that powered the machinery and that's what you need. You need a source of power that's going to propel Springfield into becoming a national and international manufacturing and industrial location and it was Level's water wheel that did it. That is Dr. Dr. Linus Russell. Thanksgiving morning, 1886, Dr. Linus Russell and his mechanic, Henry Vall, wheeled out of Henry's barn, which was also his mechanic shop, this very interesting three-wheeled three doctor's gig. Dr. Linus Russell was sitting on the top seat. Henry Vall was in the bottom, stoking the engine and making sure things were all right. It left the barn, and the, according to the to the newspaper of the day, there were at least 5,000 people standing outside this barn wanting to know what was going on. This strange machine went down Springfield City streets at the truly amazing speed of 25 miles an hour, belching black smoke. According to the newspapers of, day, of the day, the horses reared, the ladies fainted, the children went running up and down the street cheering and laughing, and the men, of course, were standing around saying, it's never going to work. Well, the first run was going actually fairly well until the first accident. The um, firebox that Vol was so carefully tending fell out. So the machine lost its steam and didn't go anywhere. With a little help from some of the people in the area, Vol was able to get the um, box repaired and the steam built up and they went along just fine. Accident number one. Accident number two um, occurred very soon after when they were going around a corner and one of the wheels got stuck in the interurban rail. It sent this machine into Philip Smith's grocery store in grocery store in a sense, almost creating the first drive-through grocery store. After lifting the machine off of the rails, but they took it back to the barn. Henry Vall decided later on in the day that he was going to take a ride by himself, which is a trick because you really should have two people, one to steer, one to make sure that the boiler stays hot. And sure enough, it stalled and Dr. Linus Russell had to come get him. Well, the last and final attempt that day occurred in Henry Vall's barn. As they were getting the steam up and hoping that this would indeed be the best run of the whole day, that renegade spark jumped from the firebox to the hay, from the hay to the wall, from the wall to the roof. It burnt the barn, it burnt the hay, it burnt the wooden carriage of the first patented steam automobile in the United States Dr. Linus Russell, local surgeon and inventor, and Henry Vall, 1886, Springfield, Ohio. One of our most flamboyant and interesting inventors was William Whiteley. In fact, he was both an inventor and an entrepreneur and a self-promoter extraordinaire. He invented a binder reaper in about 1854. So you're getting close to the Civil War and it became especially important after the Civil War when you had so many men coming back maimed or during the Civil War their families, especially their wives, had to plow the fields and do things out the field. So as far as Whiteley was concerned, he was going to make the lightest, most efficient, most economical binder reaper that could be built. On top of that, his strong desire was to turn Springfield into a town that would rival Chicago. He was ready to bring his stuff to the world, but you know, first he had to bring it to Springfield. And so he would do things literally like field tests, as in taking his binder reaper out into somebody's field and reaping their field for them to make sure they understood how light, efficient, 
and economical his um, Binder Reaper was. If that didn't quite convince you, then he would bring the Binder Reaper into downtown and parade it and his horse up and down the streets of Springfield. If that wasn't quite convincing enough, then he would take the harness off the horse, put it on himself, and go running up and down, pulling this Binder Reaper behind him, as people said, panting like a, ho like a dog in July. If you were not convinced, this is a slightly apocryphal story, supposedly he would take the Binder Reaper and hook it up to a flock of chickens. Nonetheless, he was indeed an inventor and a self-promoter extraordinaire. As you can see by this picture, yes, this is indeed the White House. And what you are seeing is then President Harrison mowing the White House lawn with Whiteley's Binder Reaper. By 1886, two of the partners with Whiteley had gone on to other things. One was O.S. Kelly, and he decided to concentrate on his own business. So Whiteley was on his own. At that point, he created this amazing complex that he called the East Street Shops. The East Street Shops were the biggest manufacturing interest um, and it was rivaled only by the Krupp Works in Germany. So the two of them were the biggest manufacturing complexes at that time in the late 1880s. You could go from raw material to finished product, which of course is why you needed good sources of transportation. There were so many railroads here that a lot of the railroads had a spur right into the factory. You just pull off your freight car right into the factory, unload your raw products, fill up again with your finished materials, and take them out wherever they needed to go. So let's talk a little bit about patents and patent models, because that's really an important part of American manufacturing history. By the terms of the, con the American Constitution, inventors have the right to um, benefit from their inventions, which is wonderful. If you invent something and you can patent it and manufacture it, then you ought to be, be able to have that money and have that influence and that acclaim from your invention. Well, early on, the patent office didn't require a model, but most people submitted a patent model and their specifications and all their drawings all of it at the same time. What we have are some of the patent models that the patent office finally decided that they did not want anymore. There was a bad fire in the patent office, and some of them were destroyed. Some of them went to the Smithsonian. Some of them were sold. So the patent, off, the patent models you see in this case were ones that we had bought. Patent models are important because it also is a good representation of the changes that were going on in Springfield, and especially this man here. This is Harry Tolman, very, very interesting man. He didn't live here originally. But a group of manufacturers and entrepreneurs got together and decided that what this progressive era up and coming town of Springfield needed was a good patent attorney who could litigate for them. They went to Washington, D.C. and talked to Harry and they must, uh, whatever the inducements were, I'm not sure, but they, they persuaded him to come in 1886 and he had his offices in the Bushnell building. He is so important because when the Wright brothers needed patent help and needed to file patents, they came here on the Interurban to talk to Harry Toulmin, who also was a specialist in patent litigation and successfully defended the Wright brothers' patent against the Curtis patents and infringement. So the, it has always been said there would have been no Wright brothers without Harry Toulmin.